morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House. Well, as all of you know, the uh, churches in British Columbia, along with other groups that uh, had been meeting with under 50 people, um, now we're not able to do so because of the lockdown with the COVID-19 uh, circumstance that uh, is unfolding. So here we are online. Welcome, everyone. I just want you to know that uh, I understand everyone's frustration in this time, but this is a time for us to turn to the Lord for strength and for wisdom from His Word. So today, if you're listening uh, from our congregation, bless you. Uh, If you're not and you're from a different congregation or you're from out of the area, well, we're glad you joined us this morning. I believe God has a timely word for each one of us here uh, in our series in the book of First Peter, it just happens that uh, we are in the book of First Peter, chapter two, from verses 11 to 25. That is our text this morning. I'll be bringing a message to you uh, that I've entitled "Purity and Authority." So, if you would just bow with me in prayer, um, we'll pray before I start. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to gather uh, over the airwaves. And Lord, we understand the perilous times that we're facing, the, the crisis that is upon our nation and on the world. But God, you are not um, surprised by all of what's happening. And as a matter of fact, God, you have much to say about your sovereign control over every aspect of this world's affairs. We understand, God, that we have an enemy that, dis- that wants to discredit the church, wants to uh, render us ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of you. But Jesus, you have said other things. You have said that no weapon formed against us will prosper and that you will be with us to the very end of the age and that you have uh, our eternity in perspective and clarity where, Father, we don't at times we wonder what's going on, but you, you know the future. And we just thank you for this time. I pray that your word would come from my mouth in power and authority, the way that you have intended for it to. So Holy Spirit, I yield myself to being used by you to speak to these people today. God, I pray that hearts would be opened and that hearts would hear the word that your Holy Spirit would say to the church today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, um, the text again, 1 Peter 2, 11 to 25, the Apostle Peter, and for those of you who've been following the sermon series that I've been preaching, uh, the Apostle Peter has just finished his dialogue with the church, sharing with them the destiny of the church and becoming a temple for God to dwell in, made up of living stones and Contrary to the Israelites who had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah because they were looking for this tangible, physical, military leader, um, they, they looked at Jesus Christ as being a stone that was a stumbling stone. And um, Jesus had come to build the foundation of a new temple. They didn't understand this. They stumbled over it. And uh, they wanted to... Uh, hold on to their old system, the old way of doing things, the old covenant. And we see Jesus had plans to start a a new covenant where he himself was the cornerstone. Why? Because Jesus proclaimed himself in many places throughout the scriptures to be God, unlike some who would suggest that he was just a teacher or an archangel or something like that. Jesus, in so many places, proclaimed himself to be God. So he said that he would be the start uh, of a new temple, a new building, where people would be connected to him, where he would set the course for people, where they would no longer uh, consider meeting Jehovah in one physical place, but God himself would dwell within the believers would write his words upon their hearts uh, in the presence of his Holy Spirit. And um, Peter went on to exclaim to the people 
in, that he was writing to that they were God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And we today in the church today are no different than the uh, believers in that church that Peter was addressing. We are God's special possession. Once both you and I were bound in chains of darkness, but now we've been set free. We have reason to rejoice because God has given us uh, freedom inside of our spirits from the bondage of sin, which leads to death. He's opened our spiritual eyes where his glorious presence fills us with his light. And uh, we become the bride of Christ. That's another example. Shining and brilliant, um, we are God's chosen. We are God's, the partakers of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power of that resurrection um, in the person of Jesus Christ. One day, the Bible says that he will take his people to be with him forever. Jesus Christ, the first fruit of the resurrection to come. You and I, if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, will be ushered into the presence of God for all of eternity. What a gift from the Father of lights. And now the Apostle Peter encourages the believers, making it uh, an urgent appeal to the saints. He's got a very important message to preach. Now, in light of the fact that we are the bride of Christ, In light of the fact that we are the temple of God made of living stones filled with his spirit. In light of the fact that we're a royal priesthood serving God. uh, We are a kingdom of priests before him. In light of all of that, Peter continues, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you, notice the emphasis, as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. So Peter has this urgent appeal. He calls the believers foreigners and exiles. We don't really belong to the system of this world. We're different. The system of this world is bound by another slave driver. Uh, the, the scriptures say, Jesus said, my yoke is easy, come unto me. You know, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You, see, you can't serve God and um, the devil, you see. If you're not serving the Lord, you're actually under the realm of the kingdom of darkness, and he's a cruel taskmaster. And Jesus calls us as believers uh, to, be, to live here as foreigners and exiles, to, obtain, to abstain from sinful desires which wage against our soul. So, as stable living stones, we talked about stability last week, about how stone is stable, but the stone of the church, the stone of the heart of the person that belongs to Christ, is stable but alive. It's not just a dead piece of stone. Um, Peter encourages the believers to live in the freedom and life that God has given them. But he wants us to recognize the parameters of what this means. Freedom. What does freedom mean to you? What does freedom mean to me? It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But it's important, regardless of what we have grown to think about what freedom is, that we understand what freedom is in the context of God's Word. That is so important. As we've submitted our lives to Christ, we've been forgiven of rebellion against Him. The good news is that the power of darkness over our lives, the prince of the power of the air, the the god of this world, the false god who rises up and calls himself uh, greater than Jehovah, this this false god uh, that had our hearts bound, that power was shattered on the cross. The marvelous light of God's salvation shone brightly upon us from the empty tomb. We are now this royal priesthood, a holy nation connected with Christ, built into him as uh, a beautiful building filled with the presence of God. The bride of Christ, dressed in robes of white, we're we're adorned beautifully, uh, the living temple of God. 
The rest of the world continues, and we see it all around us, to exist and to trudge through life outside of salvation. They're still bound by the chains of rebellion that separates all men from God. But my friends, if you have believed in Christ as your Savior and you are born again, you are set free. You are set free. So as born-again believers, cleansed as a holy nation of God, we're totally at odds with the world system and the values that we see around us, our culture of bondage to sin. And this is why Peter calls us foreigners and exiles. Um, we are radiant. We are strangers. We are not of this world. That was an old song sang by Petra, if you remember. I'm dating myself now. but um, Once we were bound over to disobedience like the rest of humanity, bound in chains, bound by sinful passions and sinful ways of thinking. But now we are no longer bound by those things. We can choose to follow after those things, but we are not bound by them. We can choose to follow the Lord. And this is why there is an urging, there is a choice to make, to submit ourselves and humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. We have been chosen by God to be His special possession and to declare His praises. The Apostle urges us to remember that once we were lost in sins and bound by them, but our old nature is defeated. The power has been defeated, the power of sin. But, so, but Peter says we have this choice. He implores us. He says, I urge you, urge you, abstain from sinful desires which were against your soul. You see, the soul is comprised of our mind, our will, and our emotions. It's that part of us that, you know, that's the animal life kind of, the, the, the mammal part of us. Our mind, will, and emotions, just like any other creature, we have thinking process, we have decisions to make as to where we're going to go and what we're going to do. Okay, and, and, and we have feelings about that, right? We have, we have thoughts, we have feelings, we have decisions to make on where we're going to go. But we're not just like brute beasts as believers that are born again. Our spirit is alive, and the spirit is to lead the soul, not the other way around. Sometimes people let their emotions, their thinking, and their decisions flow from that behavior that, that, that is soulful. Well, God wants us to be led by the Holy Spirit, to be spiritual men and women of, that are called by His name. You see, you are a new creation in Christ. Your spirit is alive. You are born again, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What was dead because of sin is now alive. Your spirit is alive. So, there, but we're still continuing this battle. You see, this is why he has to urge the believers. There's a battle going on within us. And our effectiveness in carrying out our mission for God in a way that glorifies Him rests on securing victory in this battle. And every one of us wants uh, to do things that our sin nature desires. We, we, we gravitate towards that. But the Bible says that we need to abstain. We need to turn our minds away from that which is evil. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, it says in another passage. You see, Peter urges the believers to come to terms with the fact that sin shall no longer be the master. The power has been broken. Therefore, any ground that we yield to sin or rebellion, you see, the definition of sin is rebellion against God's authority. Any ground that we yield to sinning is no longer an irresistible compulsion as it was before we come to, came to know Christ. We have a choice now. We have a new nature to be or not to be, holy or not to be holy. That is the question. We're part of the family of God now. We must choose to be holy just as Christ is holy. Let freedom reign, my friends. We are free men. We're free because Jesus has set us free from the irresistible compulsion to sin. We must choose 
We are called to choose, to yield to the Holy Spirit, to yield to the Word of God written on the pages of our heart, abstaining from the rebel passions and desires which rage against our soul. And this is done when we recognize the freedom that has been granted to us in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's given us overcoming power by His grace. Um, but just because we're born again, we're not robots, right? We, we talked about this. We're not robots well, without temptations to choose things that are other than what is righteous. We have a choice. God's given us that choice. We must submit to God's will and obedience and humble ourselves before Him. Humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxieties upon Him for He cares for you. This is a time in history where anxiety is rampant. Cast all of your cares upon Him. Let Him take your anxieties because He cares for you. See, Jesus doesn't want anything coming in between Him and us. And the question is, do we want anything coming in between us and Him? I pray that we don't. I pray that we want to draw close to Him. We're freemen. We have choices to make. Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. The submission of our will to be obedient to Christ and the power of the Spirit He has given us in this temple has a direct impact on our closeness to God. See, God's desire is not that we just know about Him. His desire is that we know Him and that we are close to Him, that we walk closely with Him, not that we just have knowledge about Him. So many people have emphasized head knowledge over knowing personally relationally, God closely. Hillside Community Church has a mission, as do the other churches that are part of the body of Christ. But I believe the Lord has called us to a very specific mission. And if you look at our mission statement, if you've never looked at our mission statement, you should look at our mission statement. This is our mission statement, my friends. To bring the message of God's grace, salvation, restoration, and eternal life through Jesus Christ to a lost and broken world and make disciples. That's what it's all about. That's our mission. That's our mission statement. That brings glory to God. God's called the church gathering here in this place to be effective and productive in the mission that He's called us to do. We are the church, not a building. Not an institution. When I speak to you, I speak, I speak to the church bought with the blood of Christ, cleansed and set apart. Not of this world. Foreigners and exiles in this world. Every believer comprises the church as that building of living stones. The bride of Christ, collectively. This is our mission choice. When you think about our mission. Our mission choice is to love or not to love, to give or not to give, to serve or not to serve, to send or not to send, to live or not to live, to obey or not to obey. May the Lord give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to His church. We have choices to make, my friends, to love or not to love. To give or not to give. To serve or not to serve. To send or not to send. To live or not to live. To obey or not to obey. What God says to us as marching orders is so important. We cannot allow our mind to be dominated by our own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways and He will what make your paths straight. We have to go to the Word of God. We have to go to the Bible. If we don't rest upon the principles of the Word of God and we allow our feelings, our mind, 
our decision-making process and how we feel with our emotions guide us. We will step out of line with the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit is led by, by the principles in the Word of God. So if we want to know how to live, we need to look at the Word of God and we need to take it seriously. No matter what we think about it, no matter what we feel about it, no matter what kind of decisions we're used to making, if they're not in line with the Word of God, we need to turf them and we need to fall in line with the Word of God. God wants us to see and in Second Peter 1, 3 to 8, he, he wants us to see this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, he's, he's, through, through these he's, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. My friends, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure... They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit is at odds with the flesh desire. You see, what seems right in our flesh, in our mind, will, and emotions outside of Christ, that needs to be checked at the door. We need to come under submission to the Lord. Well, I can't help myself, someone might say. I'm bound over to disobedience. That's a lie from the enemy. If you've been saved by the blood of Christ, you have come into His family as a believer in Him, you are not bound by sin. Sin no longer is your master. The one whom the Son sets free, he shall be free indeed. The power of darkness has no dominion over you. So put that aside. God has given you not what a spirit, not a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and soundness of mind. The war that rages in us is a war to try and get us to forget who we are and take our eyes off the truth. If we're distracted from the truth, we'll be rendered ineffective in our witness out here in this community. God wants us to shine like stars in the universe. He doesn't want us to have a cover over it, a cover of fear over our witness. We have power in the name of Jesus to trample on snakes and scorpions. Jesus told his disciples, Luke 10, 19, and it applies to us, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. We are so afraid that the system of this world and the God of this world is going to harm us. I'm telling you, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of the government. We don't have to be afraid of the snakes and the scorpions that are behind all of the, the evil out there in this world because Jesus has given us authority to trample on that. He has given us authority to be at peace in the time of trouble, to understand the sovereign work of God in controlling the whole universe. There is nothing beyond Him. God is not surprised by COVID-19 crisis that's occurring. We need to stop getting so worked up about it and we need to fall in line with this scripture. The scripture says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. What is that talking about? The power of the enemy. We are not to look at this world and the system of this world the same way that those who don't know him look at it. We begin authority. You're a royal priesthood. A holy nation. A holy nation that's built on Christ. Sin is not our master. Our master is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord over His church. And this doesn't mean just some people in the church. This means all. Isaiah is clear on this point. And I've, I've said it before, no weapon forged against you will prevail and you will refute any tongue that refutes you or accuses you. Sorry. You will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. 
And this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. That's what the scripture says. This is why we're told in Romans 6, sin shall not no longer be our master because we're not under law but under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourself someone to, to someone as obedient slaves, you're obedient, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So, what does this mean for us? When we're not slaves to, to fear, when we're not slaves to the powers that rule over the, uh, the rest of the world in, in fear, we're not slaves to that any longer. What does this mean? It means that we're slaves to another master. We're slaves to the righteous one. We're slaves to Jesus. And he said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I don't see some people living in the rest of Christ out there because they forget that the snakes and the scorpions, really, they don't have to be fearful of them. We don't have to be fearful of losing out in this world. We are freemen in Christ. Free to worship Christ. Free to live, even if they take away our life or our livelihoods or we get sent to prison for the sake of Christ. The Lord is with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Our kingdom is not here. Canada is not our kingdom. The United States is not God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is within us and it resonates into eternity in a heaven that he has prepared for us that love him. The kingdom of God is inside. So it doesn't matter what happens. And you know what? When we come to this understanding, God frees us inside to be at peace in the time where everyone else is running in panic and anxiety. God says in verse 12, Peter calls us to live such good, good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. You see, again, this takes us back to our mission because we're free. We can live lives that are positive and impact on the mission. Peter calls us to effectiveness through holiness. Not legalistic, not arrogant, like we're earning our salvation in some sort of spiritual Boy Scout troop. You know, like where we earn badges based on our behavior. No, holiness out of the fear of the Lord. Living lives in the holy reverence of God by living good, wholesome, and free lives in front of the pagans. This is done in practical ways. Live such good lives among the pagans. Though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds. Unfortunately, sometimes the pagans look at our lives, they accuse us of doing wrong, and they see malice on our part. This should not be, brothers. This should not be. We have practical instruction here in the Word of God. Resurrection power in us gives us freedom and strength to steer clear of fear-based decision-making. Proactively, we are to involve ourselves with activities that are helping and healing Living good lives, that's a practical thing. Let's find a place in this world to do some good. Not to get angry and to shout and to trample and to face the scorpions and the snakes the way the world faces scorpions and snakes. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Peter gives us real practical ways on how we can do this. What, is this? what does he say? 
verses 13 and 14. Submit yourselves to the Lord for the sake, for the Lord's sake. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Do you remember who's talking here? My friends, it's important for us to understand in context who's talking here. This is Peter. This is the guy who took the sword when they were taking Jesus and cut off the high priest's servant's ear to try and defend the Lord and his kingdom by force. Does this sound like the same person? No. You see, Jesus had to correct Peter in his understanding of what it meant to live as a servant of the kingdom of God. He had to correct him. It was not by might, not by power that he was to advance the kingdom of God, but by the spirits within him. And how do we do this? We fight evil with good. We fight hatred and fear with love and trust in the Lord God. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. A person may say, I have a problem with this. What if the rulers are evil? I don't have the time of the day for the laws of men. I serve God, so I'm not bound by the laws of men. But God says that we are bound by the laws of men, but not bound to the laws of sin. Like Daniel, there are times when we're asked to worship a false god that we say no. But there are other times when we serve God by obeying the emperor. The Lord is our master. And for the Lord's sake and for his glory, right here it says, for the Lord's sake, we are to submit to every human authority. Whether it be prime ministers, premiers, delegates, police officers that are put in place to keep the order of our society. And this does not mean that all authority tells us uh, what every authority tells us to do. We're to do it if they call us to break the laws of God. We are to be... Uh, resistant to that but we do so in the right way if an oppressive government tells us to burn the bible or not to tell people about jesus or in the case to turn people over to the authorities so they can be herded up and taken into camps we're to disregard those evil instructions resist those instructions and hold fast to the lord's principles but we're still to love and respect in the areas where we are called to love and respect. We may be facing persecution down the line, be thrown in jail, or even executed for obeying God. This has been happening through history since the beginning. We've lived in this bubble of, of freedom here, but it's not our right. It's a gift of God for the time that we've had. But what I'm talking about is the authority placed over us by God in the vast majority of circumstances, it needs to be obeyed. Because of the rebel nature in each one of us, we have this desire to do as we please, and we've allowed it to develop into a complex of anti-authority rebellion. Many Christians have yielded to the Spirit, disregarding the governing authorities to suit their own purposes, claiming that they are freemen. People of God, we're free, but we are not in that we are not bound by the laws of sin and death, but we are slaves of righteousness. This means that we are to do good with glad and sincere hearts. And this, in practical terms, means being good law-abiding citizens in submission to our governing authorities. This is not my word. This is not Pastor Clint's word. This is the word of God in First Peter. This is the same word that came out of the guy who took the sword. Jesus has a different path for Peter and he had to teach him some things. Are we above learning? Maybe we need to pay attention to this. Those of us who have been stealing, we must steal no longer. Those who have been disregarding the traffic laws, we must disregard them no longer. 
Those who have been dishonest on their tax returns, they must be disobedient no longer. We've got to come to terms with the Caesar of our day and render forth to Caesar that in this generation the things that are his and to God the things that are his. Why must we do this? Because of love for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. God loves people. He loves the people out there in this world. And he knows that if we become a militant band of rogues out there, we are not going to gain any kind of ground with the people that don't know Christ. We're called to be servants and witnesses. For the Lord's sake, submit to governing authorities. God loves us. He loves the people that are dying out there. Do we think more about ourselves and about our comfort and about our rights and our freedoms? Jesus Christ gave everything up for our freedom so that we could have freedom. We care more about ourselves than we do about the lost and the dying out there who will be pushed away from hearing the gospel to stop up their ears when they don't see us acting in a way that is Christ-like. The Lamb of God. Are we acting like the Peter who before he learned his lesson took the sword out and drew it to slice off the ear? Or are we acting like the Peter who says this? You see, the difference is Peter came under submission to the Lord and, and he, the Lord asked him if he loved him. And he says, yes, you know I do, Lord. And he says, what do you say? Feed my lambs. You see, Jesus, the Lamb of God, died for those people out there that are bound by darkness. We become living witnesses to Jesus' life, changing power and participate with Jesus in his mission of mercy. People, Jesus is calling us to live in the freedom he's given us. Our life does not need to be duplicit with one slice going for sinful selves and the other slice going for God. God desires the people of Hillside Community Church to live the mission that he called us to live, to be effective and productive in our walk with him. Peter continues, verses 15 to 17, for it is God's will that by doing good, by doing good, not calling people out and saying we need to have a revolution and, and have civil war. What is that? That is not of God. It is God's will that by doing good we should silence the talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the empire. This is Peter talking this. Do we see the heart of Peter in these words? We've got a higher calling than just living for ourselves, for our own comfort, protecting our own families. Yes, we do this, but our primary mission is to pour ourselves out like a drink offering on the sacrifice, like Paul did. Like Jesus did for others. We're to love rather than pull back into our castles and pull back into our fortresses, we're to show the love of Christ by advancing the gospel and going to where there's needs. What can we do to meet the need of today? There's people out there that are afraid. There's people that are out there that are, are sick and afraid. How do we meet them? We have to go practical with this. Like this spring, we, we went and we delivered groceries. That's practical. What other ways can we do this? How do we rescue people in their distress? That's what God considers as pure religion. Keeping ourselves from being polluted by the world and making a difference out there with people that are, that are hurting and oppressed and broken. Well, what if my boss or the person placed in authority over me is a jerk? I mean, I can't just let them push me around, right? Well, what does the Bible say, my friend? If we're hired under an employment contract, our boss is our master over us. And God calls us to submit to his or her authority. Yes, we can quit. We can quit. We can just walk away. But consider the word of the Lord. God loves your boss or that crazy person that you have to work beside that nearly drives you to the breaking point. What about politicians 
and health authorities who say that we cannot enter a store without a mask or we cannot do this or cannot do that. God does not promise us that yielding to his authority will give us freedom from human authority in things such as this. You see, yielding to human authority in things such as this is not easy. But God calls us to do this out of reverent fear for him, knowing that he has permitted us to live in our present circumstances for a reason. He wants us to be a light and a witness in the darkness of our environment. Show proper respect to everyone. That's what we just read here. That's what Peter says. Show proper respect to everyone, including government officials who we don't like. Love those people in the family of believers, even those who have different views and different consciences than us. We're called to humble ourselves before God, believing that He has the whole world in His hands and He will not let anything happen to us that is outside the realm of His influence. Remember what Jesus said when he told his disciples, Therefore I tell you, he said, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and body not more than clothes? With COVID crisis, my friends, how does this apply? How does this apply in the book of Revelation when we see things unfolding in the future? How does this apply? There's things that are beyond our control. God understands, and He understands what's going to happen, and they're beyond our control. We need to trust in the Lord that He's going to take care of us. This is not foolishness. This does not make sense to the natural man because we're taught that we need to control our environment. Well, God says, submit to me and trust me. Does it mean being silly? No. No. It just means that we can't get bound up about this and militant about things that are beyond our control. We need to trust God to take care of us. This is not foolishness, my friends. This is faith and fear of the Lord. Honor the empire. Honor the emperor, sorry. (laughs) The empire. Sounds like Star Wars. No, honor the emperor. Honor the emperor emperor. I think this is profound. You see, Peter lived in a time when the government was an authoritarian regime. Not easy to honor a dictator now, is it? Is it easy to honor a dictator? No. It does not say to honor your duly affected, go- uh, elected government official here. It, that's not what it says. Elected by the people and for the people. It says honor the emperor. What is an emperor? An emperor is a totalitarian dictator. You see, this is counterintuitive for people used to having a say in what their governor or government decides. Not everyone has this privilege. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's very nice to have this privilege and we should be thankful when we have it. Because it is a freedom and it is a a wonderful thing. But most people throughout history, most believers did not have this privilege. Most people lived in societies where the king or the emperor had the final say. And what he said goes. And if you don't like it, off with your head. That's the kind of emperor that Peter was serving. They wouldn't just come into Caesar and, 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 and yell at him. If they did that, their heads would be lay, rolling across the floor. God says... This is not Pastor Clint saying. God says, honor the governing authorities. God says, honor the emperor. Either we're students of the word of God and we believe the word of God to be true or we don't. Let's not fool ourselves. We can't rise up and become um, above the word of God just because we feel a certain way. Our mind, will, and emotions need to come under check of the spirit. And the spirit tells us what his will is through the word. We believe this, right? Sola Scriptura? Then it's time to live it. Peter tells people under such circumstances, he says, slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. How does this apply in Canada? I think we can draw the connections. 
For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. Why do we do this? Out of honor to the Lord. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He who committed no sin, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who just, judgely, judge, judges justly. He himself bore our sins his body, in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. He, he quotes this. Peter is quoting that scripture, by his stripes we are healed, saying we've been healed spiritually by being brought into the presence of Christ by coming under his dominion, by being filled with his spirit, we've, we've returned to the shepherd and overseers of our souls. This is the same Peter who was the militant guy, right? What is he saying? Ah, I was wrong. That's what he's saying in his demeanor. I was wrong when I did that, when I tried to take things into my own hands, but now I see that I need to trust the Lord and I need to live like Jesus. Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross so we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And it's not just forgiveness that we need. We need power to live righteously. See, forgiveness is the start. But the Spirit dwells in us so that we can live out righteousness. That now our sins have been taken care of. Our unrighteousness is been taken care of, we can truly live as servants of righteousness. By his wounds we've been healed, the shepherd and overseer of our souls. His grace, his forgiveness, and his indwelling presence has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. So that even though they accuse us of doing wrong, and when they look at our lives, they're going to see exemplary behavior and that will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as freemen. Freedom to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Freedom from the fear that, that binds the rest of the world. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask God that you would give us insight into how to apply it practically. For each person out there, it might mean something different. I don't know, Father, but you understand exactly how this needs to be applied. I pray, Jesus, that hearts would be changed, that our lives would be resonating your glory, God, and that we would see our light increase in, in its brilliance in this community in this dark time. God, help the people out there in their struggle with this whole thing. Help them to be, uh, to be attuned to what your Spirit says to the church. To turn their eyes away from the way that they used to deal with things in their flesh. And to turn to you and to submit to you and to your guidance in this matter. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.